Hello, uh, thank you for joining the Descent Ultimate Dive Series uh, Descent webinar. Here we're going to speak with experts from the dive world to hear their stories. Um, I'm your host, Ben Collins, a senior product manager with the, the Garmin Dive category. Um, I've been scuba diving for 20 years, but uh, just began free diving two years ago. Um, I, I was a professional triathlete for a decade. <laughs> Um, and getting into to free diving was instantly appealing to me just because of the, the uh, skill and training it takes to improve. Um, but I also found it's very different from, from endurance sports I've done in the past. It's also very different from scuba diving. Um, I was really lucky to have a great instructor getting into free diving. He taught me the basics of diving, how to be a great safety for my dive buddies. Um, and that is our guest today, Lance Lee Davis. Um, here from Southern California. Lance is a competitive freediver. He holds the U.S. national record in CNF, that's constant weight, no fins, uh, 74 meters. Um, he holds a Guinness World Record uh, related to apnea diving. I think we'll learn a little bit more about that as Lance snickers. And in 2020, he competed an underwater Everest first ascent, completing 148 30.5 meter <laughs> deep dives to travel 9,028 meters, that's 29,619 feet for you people in the U.S. Um, underwater. Uh, aside from his own accomplishments, Lance has been uh, bringing people into the sport of freediving as an instructor for the last six years. Um, recently, he helped with the, the cast of Avatar. Um, and in 2022, Lance received the Outstanding Instructor Award from PFI, Performance Freediving International. Um, you can find Lance on Instagram at SoCal Spirit, S-O-C-A-L-S-P-E-A-R-I-T, um, to follow along with his uh, cooking, boat building, dive instructing, and, and um, being a free diver in Southern California. Uh, everyone tuning in, uh, thank you for joining us. We will have Q&A at the end, so please post your comments in, uh, in the Q&A, and, and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, welcome, Lance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so tell me first how you got into freediving. What, what was, what got you into the sport of freediving? So uh, I guess it's a multi-step journey. Um, I've always been in the water. Uh, you know, I've always loved open water. Uh, my very earliest memory is memory is, is salt water actually. Um, we lived on a beach in Malaysia. Uh, and then I started swimming competitively when I was six years old, uh, ate, slept, breathed swimming for my entire childhood and adolescence, um, and then kind of burned out on it. But then, so I got into free diving the way I currently am through spearfishing many years later, um, even after all the years of competitive swimming, uh, I never really discovered it in the way that I did when I picked up a spear gun here in Southern California. I love seafood. I love, uh, I love a physical challenge. I love the ocean and I, I love, you know, kind of the ruggedness of the ocean. I love the wilder side of, of what's there. And so when I discovered that spearfishing was a thing I could do, having already been living in SoCal for a while, um, I was just immediately hooked and then uh, I started training again because uh, I realized, you know, a little bit of time in the pool or at the gym seemed to pay a lot of dividends when it came to my enjoyment of, uh, of the freediving here. And I got into competition, competitive freediving in pools fairly early just because we, uh, we had some pool comps here in L.A. back then. This was like, you know, 12 years ago. And um, it was a pretty it wasn't a big jump for me to get into anything competitive in a pool. But I didn't, I, I, it, the pool stuff was like, okay, you know, it's just something I'm doing. And then I got into, I've always loved depth. That's always been uh, something that, that I like to do. And so I, uh, about six years ago, I started, I decided I was going to uh, start chasing records, uh, the U.S. national record for, for no fins and um, started teaching and doing it full time back then. And so that's just kind of, yeah, like that's my, that's my story. Basically competitive swimming and then spearfishing is what took me down this, uh, this um, path. And, and no fins is, uh, that's, that's just doing sort of breaststroke pullouts. Like, yeah, um, yeah. Like what you would do off the wall in the pool, but you just do it until 74 meters deep. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, uh, I was a butterfly. A uh, hundred fly was my favorite event, my best mm-hmm. event when I was a swimmer. And so the underwater portion of the butterfly stroke is is virtually identical to my CNF stroke. And then I, uh, I had really lousy kick back then, but in the interim, I got really into martial arts and and uh, was able to progress mm-hmm. an awful lot on hip flexibility. And so it, when I sort of like. Like, and I've always just kind of liked swimming without the fins on. I mean, I love the fins, but uh, it just feels yeah. very pure to me, you know. That's, uh, it seem, seems like freediving is a sport that a lot of other uh, activities and skills really contribute to, to being a great freediver. You mentioned martial arts and competitive swimming. Um, what, are, what are some of the other common backgrounds you hear from people that, that become good at freediving? So, um, you know, a big driver is people want to see stuff, you know, and so I think uh, I kind of loosely group a lot of uh, motivations for for starting free time. They really fall into a hunting category. Either somebody straight up wants to spearfish or something, or they're just like a, a photographer, and they're like, oh, I want to get closer to animals. I want to um, I want to have more mobility. I don't want to deal with the gear, you know, for photos. And then, or even like, uh, you know, and I, I get a handful of students that are like, they're not really interested in any of that, but they're like, no, but I want to, I'm going on a trip. I want to swim with orcas. I want to swim with whales. That to me, that's also still a type of hunting. Um, so I would say that, that driver to like see stuff is, is, is probably one of the, one of the main ones, uh, for people. And yeah. then, a little bit, you know, kind of there's a meditative aspect to the training that some people enjoy. Uh, this sort of looking within. Um, we always joke that you get into free diving, you know, initially to see stuff. And then eventually you get into competitive diving and line diving to see within yourself. And and then, um, uh, but yeah, I, the competition and competitive diving is a much, uh, is, is not as much of a motivator. People uh, like like yourself, for instance, that maybe have a competitive swim background seem to gravitate sure. more quickly to the competitive side. And then, uh, but I, I, it's a funny sport, as you were mentioning, there's athletes, you know, we get athletes from all different types of athletes, non-athletes, many things that you would think that it can be very counterintuitive as to like what makes a good free diver and what skills contribute, I would say. Yeah, I know coming from endurance, the thing that really surprised me was, uh, you know, if you're on the bike, the thing that makes you better is you just try harder. You put in more time, you, you spend more time on the bike, you try harder, you push harder, you make yourself hurt more. And those aren't things that transfer into better freediving. It's it's meditative, it's being able to relax more, it's, um, you know, really skill oriented. And, and that really appealed to me is the, the meditative aspect of of diving and then the, the deep, the free fall, that, that great feeling. So, yeah, obviously a lot of different motivations for getting into freediving. Um, so I, I mentioned that you hold a Guinness World Record. Uh, what what is that in? Uh, so I have the the most underwater somersaults on single breath. Um, I uh, it was kind of a lark. Uh, a, f- a friend of mine they were they were filming the, the Guinness TV show here in LA some years ago, and uh, they were looking for somebody to break the existing record. And I saw something on Facebook about it. And I was like, I could I I could just do that. I'm pretty sure I could just do that. And so I I kind of did. I just went to the pool, called a friend, I was like, Hey, can you GoPro me? Send it in. And they were they were over the over the moon because apparently they've been looking and 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 coming up dry for somebody for this challenge. Um, so in the competitive freediving world, a lot of people that have various uh, uh, freediving records, uh, may have one or two Guinness records, probably a pretty similar story where somebody was just like, oh, can you do this? So uh, I'm, I'm proud of it, but generally the competitive freediving records for, for in the freediving world, we train, uh, we, tr- we, we really train for. A lot of people that have freedivers with Guinness records are just like, oh, it was a lark that you did. And then, um, so in the in the world at large, people are impressed by the Guinness, but in my freediving community, if I'm like, oh, I have a Guinness world record, they're like, no, but that's not a real world record. Like, you know, like what a, a record has to be done under freediving rules and, and with freediving judges, and that's not even a discipline. So but anyway, it was fun and uh, it's, it's good bragging rights, right? Yeah, for sure. Were you dizzy after that? Uh, yeah, that's the limiting factor. I, um, uh, it was TV, so, uh, you know, like, I mean, it was real, but I, you know, kind of counted up to the record and was getting pretty dizzy. And I was like, okay, I'll just keep doing, do a few more so I can come up smiling. And um, I did have, I did have a 
like my some of my uh, safety buddies and training partners then were were national record holders, and so many tried, but the dizziness was uh, was the factor because you're you're generating a lot of CO2 on top of all the the tumbling mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So um, it gets uh, it gets kind of weird down there. Yeah, um, I can imagine. So all right, so there's different kinds of free diving. We mentioned you you have the the U.S. record in constant weight, no fins. Um, you know, there's spear diving. Uh, what, what are what are the disciplines of, of free diving? How do they kind of vary? How do people typically find their their form of free diving, or what they're they going to focus on? Um, well, so when we get into uh, competition, I mean, they split it up kind of like swimming, you know, you have butterfly and you backstroke different strokes and stuff. So uh, generally we, most people, especially starting out, associate the long fins, um, the free diving fins, you know, absurdly long fins. Uh, Mm -hmm. In competition, that's called constant weight bifin. And uh, it's actually a newer category. It's always been legal to wear the fins, but if you were wearing those kind of fins uh, back in the day, you were at disadvantage against somebody that's wearing a mono fin, which is the giant, huge mermaid tail type fin. Mm-hmm. And um, sure. so in the last couple of years, they added actually a, a specific bifins discipline. And um, uh, maybe it's a little more relatable to people, I think. And then the, the, the long fins are used in any kind of hunting and photography because they're just incredibly uh, efficient at, at, moving us around and I can, you know, when we know what we're doing, we can, we can control ourselves and our direction very precisely without needing the hands. So that mm-hmm. leaves both hands free to operate cameras or spear guns or, you know, safety other divers and stuff. Sure. Uh, all right. So when you were doing your Everest experience, that was a, a bifin attempt, yes. I assume. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so what, what motivated that what motivated the, that first ascent? So, um, you know, when you uh, when you when people ask a mountain climber, you know, oh, why why do you do it? And they they say because it's there. It uh-huh. was a little bit that, um, and and actually, it, it must have been a production, right? I mean, this wasn't. You didn't just go out and do this by yourself, right? No, no, no. I, I was so okay. The the actual story was this was of course during uh, COVID lockdown type type mm-hmm. times. And uh, I was driving home from the water. And so, of course, there were no competitions um, really anywhere in the sports world and in, in the freediving world included. And so I was I was driving home and, and I got a phone call from a from an old friend. And he was like, hey, have you have you heard of um, have you heard of Everesting? And I was like, no, what's that? And he's like, oh, you know, it's the people are doing it on on treadmills and bikes. And, and the idea is because there are no competitions. You could do this in your basement. And it's like whoever does the vertical climb of Everest in the shortest time is like, you know, that that's an Everesting is to do the vertical distance. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And he's like, so for freediving, have you heard of it for freediving? Of course, I was like, no. And he's like, dude, you know, you should you should do a free dive Everest. And um, I was like, oh, and I kind of put it aside and, you know, I was like, oh, I wanna, I'll get I'll get to this. I think this was late summer. And um, and then I I it, the idea kind of grew on me and um, it would be a challenge. You know, at the time I was like, OK, it's a lot of diving, but on long days spearfishing, I was like, I've probably done that vertical distance before um, altogether out of hundreds and hundreds of drops. But. I, it, it did occur to me, I was like, you know, but I've never done it in 100 foot, you know, like 100 foot increments, which is a, which is a bigger ask, is a, is a very different thing. We're getting into uncharted territory there. Yeah. And um, so I, uh, I got some safeties together, announced a date, and I was like, hey, this will be a cool challenge. And then I think uh, it was kind of last minute. I had a bunch of uh, great, a friend uh, volunteered a rib for a support boat. And I, I wanted to keep it kind of small because I didn't want too much to deal with. And, and uh, but I, I did get uh, like a rotate, you know, it was going to take a long time. So I, so I had a rotating mm. roster of buddies to safety me throughout the day and provide support. And then uh, and I think the, the date was like 10 days out. And it was, I was, we we're also getting to the tail end of fall because we usually you know, our best diving is fall. And then I was like, man, I, yeah, we'll just make the weather window before winter starts. And then that weekend we had our first winter storm, air temps dropped 15 to 20 degrees, water temps dropped 10 to 15. And what was going to be this cool challenge was suddenly like, oh man, it's like heavy duty winter now. Um, This is going to be 
uh, endurance and cold. So that was the and and the other specter, of course, was a little bit uh, DCS because to do it is possible to get uh, decompression illness through free diving. It's very difficult to do, but trying to do 150 100 foot dives in a day is a great textbook way to do that. So that was uh, we monitored that, and uh, that was that was kind of the unknown actually. Um, cold I've dealt with hypoxia. We all know how to deal with. Uh, but the the DCS and neuro stuff was kind of new territory for that kind of a dive, for or yeah. for that kind of a dive profile. Yeah, that's that's incredible. So what what was the overall time? How long did it take to do those 148 dives? Uh, it's it's the exact time is on the video on my YouTube, but I think it was like 14 and a half hours. Um, about 10, 11, maybe 11 or 12 hours. No, I would say 11 hours and change was in the water. And then mm -hmm. the time was like, you know, it, we broke it up, and uh, the rest of it was basically trying to warm back up on the on the on the boat and eat something. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Wow. So you, I mean, you've done a lot in uh, in your time as a free diver, um, competitively uh, spear fishing, um, and then you know, six years ago, starting to to teach other people and bring more people into the world of, of free diving. Um, so when you're when you're working with new people to free diving, um, what are what are some of we we talked a little bit about the motivations? Uh, what are some of the common fears that the new divers have? Well, um, you know, hardwired into us is a fear of the unknown. You know, that's a kind of survival evolutionary thing. So so if it's a you know it, it's I we can tell them what will happen. They can watch videos but fundamentally they're you know each student's own brain doesn't know what will happen if they say dive 40 feet on a breath hold for the first time and so uh <clears throat> i would say that's um that's definitely going to be uh a a factor and then people always worry about time you know um they're always afraid oh i don't have enough time down here and that that can be time can, logistical chronological time is is i believe is actually somewhat irrelevant during a free dive it's funny you know we're, we're here with a watch and everything but um i use my watch afterwards um not during the dive generally mm -hmm. uh free divers don't we don't consult the watch a lot underwater um having alarms and stuff can be really excellent to tell us where we're at mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one thing but i would say um Another another thing that can be a factor, especially here in California, um, is disorientation. Um, you know, a lot of times where we train, there's, uh, you know, we're just above an underwater canyon. So it's just you're kind of in nothingness. And uh, for whatever reason, some people find our water uh, inhospitably murky um, and then <laughs> uh, like dark and murky. And so disorientation, I would say, uh, when newer divers are approaching depths and stuff can be really tricky and hard to deal with um, for them. So on the deeper dives uh, that can in competition depths and stuff, sometimes that can also create some narcosis and everything. Sure. And narcosis is, is feeling a little loopy underwater. So that must be a little scary to be feeling narcosis when you're, you know, in, in sort of a extreme situation like that. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to not. Luckily for me, I don't seem to struggle with it too much so far. I mean, fingers crossed, you know, as I, as I progress deeper. But um, uh, it can be um, when we see bad accidents in competition, I would say it's often a contributing factor. Okay. Um, so the uh, but yeah, I think the 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 primary fear is just for newer divers is just, you know, they don't they're just like what will happen. You know, they don't they don't know. And um, uh, that can that can be and, and they're going to feel uh, usually a lot of very new sensations that um, are not really true dive response, you know, the mammalian dive reflex, um, there's nothing inherently calming about it. It just is something that happens and it, it's independent of the way we feel. It's just a physiological thing like that's hardwired into the brainstem. And um, not all of the sensations that accompany it are, are most of the sensations are things people would never feel on land and mm. in the same way. And um, none of them are, are inherently calming. You know, we may enjoy the activity, but. And just for for audience members that that have not heard about mammalian dive response before, what 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 is it? What is the effect of it? What causes it? 
So um, the mammalian dive response is is a survival mechanism, basically hardwired into every mammal's brain, and it's there to conserve oxygen for the brain when we're in a diving situation. And of course, this is you know deep in our our early evolution. Uh, whales and sea lions and you know like current living diving mammals all have this ability. And it really wasn't until the 50s and 60s of the last century that scientists began to realize that humans had this ability to some degree as well. And mm. nowadays, you know, the because on, on paper, the dives that even a lot of recreational divers do these days, on paper, like scientifically, it's like it doesn't work. It's just like your lungs would crush, your, you don't have enough oxygen to do that, yet people do that many magnitudes deeper. And mm -hmm. it's it's via mammalian dive response. And so when when mammalian dive response is triggered, and, and it has to be triggered, it doesn't happen on scuba, it doesn't just happen with water. Uh, you need to be holding your breath. It, cold water on the face or warm flowing water will, will trigger it. Lung compression, mm -hmm. falling oxygen levels. Tip, your typical swimming pool isn't deep enough or cold enough to really uh, to, to, to do anything in this regard. Um, so uh, when it's triggered, the 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 body's physiology changes remarkably. Um, we see uh, falling heart rates. Uh, there's a change in circulation. Uh, blood that that feeds the extremities. Blood vessels that feed the extremities constrict. Blood vessels that feed the the, the brain and the core organs open up. So blood is blood is prioritized to to our vital organs and of course blood carries oxygen so that keeps the uh the vitals supplied with oxygen and um we see as far as uh, heart rate you know like i've recorded in myself uh you know trying to induce dive response in the ocean heart rates in the low 20s and high teens within, wow. within actually seconds of of starting uh -huh. starting a drop um wow. most most free divers would not you wouldn't typically always experience it quite as strong, but if you, mm -hmm. you know, are on a quest to do that and experiment and tinker, um, and and certainly on the deep dives, on the competitive dives, that's that's the only way anyone can do it. Wow, that's that's incredible. So, I I mean, I think this is a good transition to talking about dive safety. You know, I I think a lot of people think about free diving. They they think it's a kind of sort of an extreme sport, a dangerous sport. Um, I've talked about meditation during dives and it being more of a, a relaxing, calm thing. So uh, it, how, how important is safety? What, is free diving dangerous? Um, well, so free diving is not dangerous. Blackouts are, that's, the, that's, that's <laughs> dangerous. Um, so there is a risk um, with free diving that's unique to free diving and basically uh, if somebody gets low enough on oxygen, we describe that condition, you know, as hypoxia. If the brain gets hypoxic enough, um, they just lose consciousness. And so that we call that a blackout, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same as a knockout, like a concussive knockout. Um, and at the, at the point of a loss of consciousness, there's no brain damage. Um, and in a controlled environment with redundant safety, like say a free diving competition, it's actually not even a big deal. Um, the diver's disqualified, but uh, on a, at a high level comp, I would say on any given day, 10 to 20% of the dives end in blackouts. Um, yet when that happens to your typical spear fisherman or recreational diver, a lot of times they die because um, they are maybe wearing too much weight. And so at the point of the blackout, and, and generally this is also very counterintuitive to a lot of people, but blackouts don't happen to free divers at the deepest points of their dives. They happen at the very end of the dive, at the surface, even after the diver has started to breathe again. That's where most of them happen. Um, not 10 minutes later, but within like a 15-ish second window of surfacing um, is where we see really about 90% 90, 90 of them. And, then, and those blackouts are, I mean, you're talking about people that are really pushing their own limits, you know, intentionally. Um, I mean, that's 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 where it gets tricky is um, because of the extreme changes in physiology due to pressure and depth and, and so on and so forth. Uh, blackouts in that context can happen with basically zero warning um, and we don't necessarily and so many people I, I would I'm going to go to the spearfishing world for this um, because in the co competition world it's just it's just there it's a known thing you're doing this dive that 
is maybe literally to the to the edge of your own consciousness, you know. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. of course, there's that that specter. Mm -hmm. But in the spearfishing world, um, we that's where the deaths happen, and um, that's where you know a lot of that danger is. And if you talk to most any spear fisherman who doesn't experience those levels of hypoxia on a regular basis and those symptoms and stuff like that, most of them will tell you like everything was fine. It was a dive I've done a lot of times, and I just suddenly I just was at the surface and I don't know how I got there. I couldn't see anything. My buddy was yelling and freaked out and my vision came back and he was like, you had a blackout, man. And so um, when someone's diving alone or they're wearing, you know, the buddy is unattentive and they're wearing too much weight, um, then that, you know, we had, that could be a very different situation. Right. So in your, in your class, when I took a, an intermediate class with you, um, it, it was very focused on safety. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say I learned more about dive safety there than even in, in like your Patty rescue diver course. Um, and, uh, you know, so what, what are some of the, if you could just say, you know, the most important things to staying safe, what, what are those in free diving? Um, dive with a buddy, like dive with somebody. I always, we, we say, you know, the, your buddy is like a seatbelt, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it. Like, uh, most of the time when we're driving, we're not, you know, we're not jumping in the car and having a fiery crash every time, but there are those times where that seatbelt can save your life unexpectedly. And so, um, and then certainly if we're engaged in more risky diving behaviors, either competition or, you know, certain types of spearfishing, you, it's just like, I, I'm like, I'm like, that's like a racetrack, you know? So, uh, you know, your typical diving is driving in traffic, maybe 50 miles an hour. There's a lot of uncontrolled thing, you know, uh, there's things out of your control and then competition is more of a racetrack situation. And there we eliminate certain variables. There's no oncoming traffic, you know, but we have, we're, we're, doing something that can result in uh where the the specter of accident is very real and very serious and so we have many layers of redundant safety in that context you know not just mm -hmm. a seat belt but like four point harness and a you know a roll cage and a fire extinguisher right. something like that so that, yeah, that's for multiple like, safety divers and yeah at the surface yeah. oxygen tanks at the surface that yeah so cool. we're that that's more that realm you know it's more of a more of a laboratory type environment where you mm -hmm controlling these factors. Um, so uh, in the classes, most people taking a class aren't really interested in that aspect of, of the free diving. And so we're generally teaching people to drive in traffic. And it's like, yeah, then wear a seatbelt and, um, you know, don't don't do anything stupid, <laughs> you know, like, like work up to uh, work up to the things you're doing. And uh, if it sketches you out, don't do it. Um, if it sketches your buddy out, don't do it. Because a lot of the classes, you know, people come to free diving classes thinking, oh, this is me going to learn how to dive, dive deeper, have better bottom times. And that's, that's true. Um, you know, a free diving certification uh, says that, oh, you check some boxes on certain depths and breath holds and things. But what it, what we really train is what, what, as far as I'm concerned as an instructor, I'm training my students how to safety other divers. Um, and that's, that's what the certifications really mean. It's like, okay, maybe I did some diving stuff, but I know how to safety another diver at my level. And um, to the world at large, that's kind of what, you know, that's what people care about. Uh yeah, that's, uh, I, I know when, when you were teaching me, you, you spent a lot of time talking about being on the line as a chance to sort of push my, my orange zone, my red zone, see what my limits are in a very safe context where I have multiple people watching me and out doing photography or spearing, it's a, it's a time to stay in the green. You know, I know yeah. what my limits are and, and stay well below that uh, to stay safe. So that's always stuck with me as, as something that, you know, if I know my limit, I know how to stay well below my limit. Um, yeah. And when the the consequences are higher, so. Um, so as you're training for these records, you know, I know uh, these are uh, skill and and technique and everything becomes really important. Um, what what are some of the tools you use to improve as a free diver? Um, how did you go from sort of getting into it in, in spirit diving to really being a, a master of the craft? Well, um, uh, I appreciate being called a master. I'm definitely still, uh, still learning. You know, that's that's the neat thing about about it. I would say uh, you're you're always picking up, uh, you're always refining or picking up new things. But um, you know, as far as tools, um, I grew up in swimming pools, of course, um, racing. I, like every 
hours and hours and hours a week. There's no off season in, in swimming. Um, so when I stopped competitive swimming, I, I was basically, I never want to be in another swimming pool. Um, and uh, I, I loved the water. I loved the ocean, but I was done with pools. Um, so when I discovered free diving, you know, bought my first pair of long fins the way, you know, and, and got into it at that level, um, I quickly realized the pool was a great training tool because I could reduce, I could eliminate certain variables and then just focus on technique and conditioning. And um, so I'm a fan of, uh, of, of, of like doing certain types of training in a controlled environment. And for most people that the uh, an aquatic controlled environment ends up being a pool, you know? Um, and uh, I spend a little time in the gym, um, uh, especially for depth, there's a power aspect to it. I, people, this is a little bit counterintuitive, I would say, to most people watching deep free dives. Uh, it looks very slow and graceful, and um, the, but metabolically, uh, coming up from those deep dives, and this is largely due to mammalian dive response. Um, even though it may look like that diver is just cruising super slow, I it's their muscles are working by that point usually without really any oxygen. So it's it's metabolically very anaerobic, mm -hmm. highly lactic. You're you're relying the body cycles mm -hmm. through just every available metabolic pathway over the course of the dive and ends up using a lot of type two B muscle fiber, which are you know are actually associated with extreme fast twitch. The but sprinter, in this context, they're muscles, working, right? Yeah, they're working without oxygen at a slow rate. So it's just it's a it's weird. It's not like you know other other sports in that yeah. regard. Um, for for so sure, it's, it's, a, it's a surprising sport in a lot of ways. Is, yeah. is my experience. Um, and and so I mean, you mentioned in, in diving, you're not really looking at your watch or relying on on alerts. Um, what what are some of the things that that you? How do you set that up? What yeah. are some of those? Yeah. So certainly, um, a, a watch is a great. Uh, is a, a good watch is a great training metric, a great training tool. Um, it's a great safety tool. There's a variety of things, but as far as um, watches, um, like I said, I, I don't reference the watch much underwater because it doesn't tell me a lot that's relevant, but definitely mm -hmm. alarms are great because I can feel uh, and hear those. Um, so I'll typically have, um, you know, it depends on the situation I'm in, but um, we like to know, uh, there's there's I guess on a on a particularly deep dive, there's just certain uh, threshold depths where things have to happen, um, like free fall, we call mouth fill. Um, so say on a 74 meter no fins dive, um, I've got an alarm set at 30 meters on the descent and 30 meters tells me that, oh, you can stop. I can stop swimming down at that point and just sink. Um, because everything, all the air spaces in my body and equipment has compressed enough that I can sink at a reasonable rate. And uh, we call that free fall. And of course, as, as you talked about, that's that's a really beautiful experience uh, for, I, I would say, once you get there and commit and kind of surrender to that, um, that hooks a lot of people in freediving when they, when they it and generally it takes a little while to get there. But once once somebody mm -hmm. gets there, um, they're usually like, oh, this is, this is what it's about. And so, um, I have a free fall alarm. And then of course, a lot of the finer skills with deep free diving, people think it's about the breath hold and sure, you know, we're holding our breath, but it's really about manipulating ears and sinuses and managing that air so that, um, you're diving comfortably without injury and pain, um, in the, in the sinuses and ears. And so, uh, I have a mouth fill alarm uh, that happens maybe at like, actually mine right now is set to 40 meters. And uh, so that's an equalization maneuver um, that uh, that's done. And then typically I would have a, what we call a plate alarm, which is also an alarm that's set to go off. Uh, I usually have mine about like four meters before touchdown, before like the target depth, you know, so mm -hmm. it, would, it would go off. If I'm doing a 74 meter dive, it, it might go off at 70 meters, which really means I'm like four or five seconds from the turnaround. And, uh, and then everything is pretty simple. Once we turn, you know, grab the tag, start to swim up, uh, you're just going for it. And then um, it's in a competition, the safeties would, would meet you before you reach the surface, but they don't, uh, they do not accompany us, you know, during the entire dive. 
Uh, and so on the ascent, the only alarm that the only metric that I really care about is um, neutral buoyancy and positive buoyancy. Because again, uh, as a free diver, we're not exhaling or anything, any air that we started with, we want to save. And so as I'm ascending, you know, air spaces are expanding. And so I'm becoming positively buoyant closer to the surface. Uh, usually my ascent alarm for the deep dives is set at 20 meters. Um, Cause at 20 meters, may not be fully positive, but I can kind of start to back off and cruise. And, and that's also from an energy and a hypoxia and a blackout standpoint, that's getting into that critical zone where everything's just got to be really dialed. And so, um, so yeah, I use a, I use, I, I can do old school where we count kicks and stuff like that. And, uh -huh. you know, there's ways to feel out the dive. So I like a combination of all that, but um, definitely um, that can be useful. I use the variometer too, which is in the, the new firmware update um, that uh, I have it set. So the variometer, if, if any of the audience is not familiar with it, um, it uh, you can program the watch, the garments to, uh, to beep or, or buzz um, at specific increments. So my variometer in training is usually set actually just to one meter increments. And so as I'm ascending or descending, I'm getting kind of a constant beep, beep, be, that lets me know my pace, and uh, I do find that really helpful um, as far as really dialing in the the dive. Because even though it's not free diving, isn't equipment heavy. I would say like it's not technical in that sense. It's incredibly technical on the sense of like buoyancy and pressure and volume and understanding that and trying to find sweet spots um, between you know reducing drag but being relaxed. And so it's it's the deep dives are absurdly technical in that regard right and, and as you mentioned small changes in how you dive can have a dramatic effect on the the energy you're using which can yeah. change a lot so so being able to repeat your dive uh and and look at how you did afterwards seems very important um for sure yeah so uh thank that, that those are the questions i had we have questions coming in for the audience let's try and get to some of those um we've got uh a question about Everesting. Um, how did you change your your suit? Um, did you did you change it out during the Everest? Um, did did the compression change over the course of the dives? Um, did did you kind of wear out a suit? I think is the question here. Um, yeah. So uh, I wore uh, my my wetsuit sponsor now is Best Dive. Um, at the time, uh, I didn't really have a sponsor, so I wore an Elios um, five mil smooth skin open cell. If you get and uh, um, the free diving wetsuits that, that we wear are actually really amazing. Uh, for a cold water, we use, we use what's called an open cell suit. And um, so they're significantly warmer than uh, skirt surfing or scuba suits of the same thickness. And it's the design of the suit, it's the kind of rubber that's used, and it's the open cell, which really like wicks against the skin, seals and insulates. Um, so I wore the same suit uh, uh, for that whole time. Um, back in the day, uh, you know, long day spearfishing, you know, I've done over 20 hours in the same wetsuit, um, just practically napping in the suit and stuff like that. Um, so they, uh, you don't want to be downwind of somebody in an open cell suit after 20 hours, but um, the wetsuits uh, are, are amazing in that regard. Um, and the suits do become permanently compressed uh, over time. It's many hundreds of hours, but yeah, like, like that amount of uh, diving definitely put a pretty good amount of wear on yeah. on the suit, I would say. Uh -huh. um, the for that particular attempt, the the big thing for me going into it uh, that I just understood would be a factor, and which was the factor was the cold. Um, so sure. mm -hmm. there's always you know people are like, well, then why don't you wear a thicker wetsuit? But for free diving, there's an energy cost to the neoprene that we wear. Um, so I, when I teach, I liken it to, I to explain to the students, it's like, you know, if I roll up a five millimeter wetsuit, it's like a balloon this big. And um, so I've got to pull this balloon down with me and I offset it with lead, but um, I've got to bring the lead back. So, you know, if it's too easy to go down, then it's hard to come up. So we're looking okay. for that sweet spot. The thicker the wetsuit, the more you're pulling down to neutral and the more you're pulling up back to neutral. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right. So, you know, if this is a five mil, <laughs> this is a seven mil. And so, you know, looking at the course of the day, it's like, okay, uh, you know, I'm just trying to find that sweet spot. Like I'd rather be a little bit cold and um, right. actually not bit, is, I'm like massively cold. <laughs> is that why, uh, is that why it's easier typically to dive sort of in tropical environments and warmer yeah. water, just the, the thinner wetsuit? Yeah, the energy cost is much, much less than thinner wetsuit. I mean, wetsuit, you can, people, you could argue like, oh, but it's clear water and all stuff. But I mean, I, I learned to dive in Southern California. I did my first 40 meter dive here, my first 50 meter dive here, my first 60 meter. You know, these are my home waters. I mm -hmm. love it here. Um, so you can certainly adapt to almost anything, but there's just the physics of buoyancy and that's inescapable. So everything else aside, there's a the the less neoprene I'm wearing, the lower the energy cost of the dive. And I mean, nobody sets world records in a five mil wetsuit. You go somewhere where, you know, you can wear a 1.5 or a 0.5 mil, you know, type thing. And um, granted, it might be, you know, better surface conditions and everything, but at the end of the day, it's the energy cost is significantly less. Yeah, all right. So I have another gear question about snorkels. So uh, many, you know, free diving, um, the the safety is to to not leave your snorkel in your mouth while you're diving. Uh, and uh, a lot of spiros though, oh, spear fishers, fishermen, uh, like to keep it in their mouth, uh, saying that it's more of a safety thing when you get to the surface in case a blackout occurs. What, what's your position on that? So um, I see both both sides of this. I have spear friends who have blacked out at the surface and woke up breathing through their snorkel. Uh, one actually spear woman I'm thinking of, it's happened at least twice to her. Um, she would be the first to say, oh, I was very, very lucky. And I would agree because while I do see and hear like Terry Moss, some kind of old, old timer, you know, very respect. Like I have infinite respect for a lot of wisdom that's come down over time um they're like you know it's like oh this this could save your life it doesn't my response would be like i'd rather have a buddy um a lot of spear fishermen do that because they're just like well i'm gonna dive alone um and so as an instructor and a diver whatever i'm just like that's stupid we don't get to interview the dead ones you know because <laughs> like right. uh like so you may hear stories of or some spear fisherman that's like oh yeah no it saved my life i woke up breathing through the snorkel but that was a bit of a probably an exception as opposed to the rule and um even in that case i would uh i i'm actually not a huge fan of snorkels i can use them you know and like of course but um i never wear a snorkel period uh except when i teach certain levels because it's it's part of the standard um so i'm a i'm an outlier there um uh -huh. but uh yeah, as far as the snorkel, I would, even if I was not diving with a very attentive buddy, and, and really, I still dive uh, these days. I dive as if I'm alone. I don't dive alone, but I don't expect my buddy to save my life on every drop. Now, if I clip myself to the buoy and the line and it's that type of environment, my life mm -hmm. is completely in the hands of my safeties. Um, in competition, nobody dumps a weight belt. I mean, you're just going for it. And if something happens, it's it's on the safety team. Um, and that's fundamentally, you have to trust that that's there. And then, uh, so even even diving as if I'm alone, I personally am like, no, I don't want to dive with a snorkel in my mouth. Um, uh, it's a, the reason I don't, I, I, this is probably obvious to whoever asked, asked the question, but it's a funnel into your airway. And so an unconscious diver, uh, the mouth, a relaxed human mouth is a one-way valve. Um, wearing the mask, your nose is, is closed and then air can only go out, water doesn't want to come in. But if you've got a snorkel in your mouth, it is now a funnel that's propping your airway open and you're relying only on the blast stage of defense is what we call laryngospasm. Um, so you're you're eliminating some of the, the redundant safety that's just hardwired into our physiology. So the no snorkel. You're you're sticking by what you taught us in class. Of, of yeah, no for sure. Yeah, even in a spearfishing environment, I would I yeah. would say uh, that's my. So, uh, there's there's a few questions on how you use your watch to be a better diver. Uh, we we have one. Um, what are some of the watch features that make you a better safety? Is there you know that, that help you be a better safety to someone or help someone be a better safety for you? So um, at the end of the day. When we teach, even even 
competitive competitions, like modern competitions, we have a lot of things that weren't as widely available, say 25 years ago. Um, but records were set that way. Amazing things were done without so like, cause nowadays we have cable cams and sonar and all this stuff that, that wasn't really in use a long time ago yet. So a timekeeping device, like something that reliably keeps time is basically all you, all, all that you really need to, uh, to safety another diver from the surface. Um, cause I can know how long their dive is supposed to take. Um, and do a little math and then, you know, if they're not back when they're supposed to be, if I don't see them, something is, something has changed, something is wrong. Some, it's a departure from protocol. So at the end of the day, that's, that's from a safety standpoint, that's the main thing. One thing I do like, um, I got very used to just using surface timers on watches, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I do like that, uh, I think it was like a couple of years ago, you guys added a feature where the watch could stay in diving mode, but very quickly, a couple of button presses, I could have a stopwatch running. And so, right. um, yeah, I think that's doing that. two, two button presses on the start button. I, I, I think we, uh, it was actually perhaps your recommendation that we had. Yeah, I, yeah. At, at first, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's just one more feature. I don't know that I need that. And then I've gotten to really like it. Um, so I generally use uh, the stopwatch function um, for that. And then um, uh, the alarms are are useful to the diver. I can maybe use them in a safety context, but generally, it's just it's the reliability of the timekeeping and stuff like that. That's that's mm-hmm. the main, you know. Um, as far as being a better diver myself, uh, I do like, um, one thing I did notice um, after using a lot of different watches, what I like, I started with the Mark I. Um, I wasn't a beta tester, I just bought the watch because I flooded a lot of dive watches. And um, it seemed like a very robust, durable watch. And that's actually my favorite thing about all the garments I've owned is they are so darn reliable uh and they're they're really robust in that sense and so um all right so things about the watch that help me uh i think the variometer is probably one of the coolest features um and that's that's newer but having that 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 sort of pace metric um going uh can be really good and um sometimes especially in competition we wear well sometimes we'll put a watch in the hood so we can f- hear the alarms a little better mm-hmm. um so i've dove sometimes with two watches going i've got a very i've got one in the hood and then i've got one on the rest on the wrist to uh to, to see visually because i i did talk about not looking the watch underwater but at the end of a dive you know i generally i, I peek i peek at the watch especially in a training situation you know i sure. want to i can i can get a sense of um i think this can also help newer divers actually I can get a sense of perceived effort and versus actual time. And um, so sometimes that, I think that can help, that sometimes helps new, that, I know that helps me teaching students because they're, they'll have done some breath holds in the pool before we do our first open water session. And most people in my classes, I mean, they'll do two or three, four minutes um, without any prior training just after, after the class, you know, with a little bit of coaching and some new tools in the toolbox. And then, so if they've done like two and a half minutes in the pool the day before, and they're like kind of sketched on their dive and we come up, I'm like, you know, I look at the watch and I'm like, hey, you know, you got time down there. We were underwater for 22 seconds. Um, a lot of times they're like, oh, it felt so much longer. It's like, you know, it's just, that's how it mm-hmm. felt, but you're okay. Let's relax a little bit. And and generally, you know, in, in that case, when the diver learns to sort of relax, they have a much more comfortable dive and, and they... You know, just because of the mechanics of physics and and the weirdness of a million dive response, someone can do a chronologically longer, even deeper dive than somebody doing even a a, a well done but shallower dive. Not not like a crappy panic dive, but just a bounce dive. Um, that shallower, shorter dive can end up using more oxygen at times. So. Right. So we have, we have a bunch of biometric features on the watch. There's a there's a question about how that helps you become a free, a better free diver. So, uh, you know, sleep tracking, HRV tracking, respiration rate tracking, all of these things that you can do sort of between dives. Um, do you use any of those? How do those kind of help you set up for a dive? Um, so I am a big biometric junkie and training junkie in a lot of ways. Um, the, the, uh, the Garmin's are, are, pretty amazing i guess kind of leading the field with a lot of the biometric features and the convenience and package of having it on a wrist unfortunately uh, most freedivers that own one of these probably already know this but 
the pulse oximetry and the heart rate monitor don't work very well on the wrist while you're diving um, because of a lot of it is mammalian dive response. So underwater, it's less effective. However, the heart rate monitor does work at the surface. And so um, I've got, I think with the Mark 1, I was, did the Mark 1 have, uh, the Mark 1 had a heart rate monitor, but no pulse oximetry. And so I had a lot of spear friends that figured out pretty quickly that it was amazing. Uh, the Mark 1 had this amazing ability. So at the surface, before they would, before a, a drop, they would check their heart rate. And, um, you know, I call that situational resting. They're not like true resting, but it's like, okay, I'm as rested as I can be for the situation I'm in. Maybe my heart rate is 85 beats per minute. Um, mm -hmm. And then they would do a dive. And these are Spiro. So again, they're experienced with the watches and time and they're not bothering to look at time underwater. They're just doing their thing. They're staying in the green zone because, you know, they've got problems to solve. And so once we can we can stay longer, but once we do that, our problem solving ability starts to go away. And in certain applications, like say spearfishing, um, you need a lot of problem solving ability because you're chasing things that breathe underwater and see and feel you coming at them and so on and so forth. So um, then they hit the surface and whatever, they check time, whatever. But what they're really looking at is like they're waiting for their heart rate to go back down to what it was before the dive. And they give it like 30 seconds and then do the next drop. And they figured out pretty quickly that was a much, much better metric for surface intervals than actually time, um, which is very simple, very old school, but it's, it's you know, it's more, the, the heart lets us know when the body is ready to, to say, do the next drop. So um, you can kind of know in California at the time um, who had a Garmin, because a lot of them uh, cut holes, um, like, it, you know, in the wetsuit, so they could they could have the watch against the skin and, yeah. and still read it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, now they, there are the heart rate variability features and everything. Um, I personally don't use a lot of that, although I know a lot of people that love to. I, I'm fussy. I don't like to wear I don't, like to, I, I don't like to wear you're, things. You're not a nighttime watch wear. Yeah, it's really hard for me to wear a watch <laughs> at night. And um, I, as much, and I do, I've done a lot of biometric work, um, especially in the beginning. But it's funny, as I got it more into competition, I would do less of that. I have a history of it. I understand it, and I understand mm -hmm. it didn't mean. But um, I remember one of my early, my first world championships, and one of my uh, uh, teammates you know, I had my little dive computer that I had built and, you know, I was like analyzing data. That's and he's right. like, you had, you had built your own, you know, your own dive computer. Yeah, I built it here, you know, in, in the lab. And um, my, my teammate was like, dude, where are the comp? None of that matters. It's either you make the dive, either you did the training and you make the dive or you don't. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I think this is in that particular context, it was a bit of a crutch for me because yeah. I was like already at the comp, but in training, I sure. do use a lot more. And and once you're at the comp, you, you kind of go. I, I know in training, the, the HRV has been a really good indicator for me of, you know, how it, it relates directly to my breath hold. If my HRV is really low, I know I'm not going to be able to hold my breath as long that day. Uh, same with like resting heart rate. All right. So we have we have two more questions. Uh, try and hit and then we'll wrap it up. Um, we're running out of time here. OK, um, but uh, I have a question on. Uh, I'm a 56 meter free diver training in Dahab and Cabo. I rely on an MK2 alarms heavily. I do a mouth fill at 17 meters, 23 meters, 28 meters. I free fall at 32 and the turn alarm at five meters before the bottom. What are the cool or advanced free diving features do you use that this diver may be missing? Uh, the variometer. Um, for training dives, I would turn it off for comp dives. But um, as far as, uh, you know, we are going for efficiency. And so knowing, uh, for instance, the variometer helped me at the last World Championships uh, where, because especially for me, I'm frequently training in water wearing different equipment than what I would actually wear at the big comp. And so uh, I get there, I have limited time um, because the, the, the day is coming and, mm -hmm. and I need to rest. And so I, you know, I have to reduce my training volume. So having the variometer is really helpful as far as dialing in stuff like mouth fills and especially free fall. Um, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, cause you can feel when, you know, if you start free fall too soon and those, it's those too slow. Yeah. Slow you can hear it those. as opposed to, you know, right. like, so you, I can hear changes in pace. Um, I find that, uh, really useful. Um, 
I I also find with all the garments I've owned, I can feel the vibration that like the, the vibration monitor, even on my wrist is pretty strong. I used to always have to put stuff in my hood to hear it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll wear watches in my, I use the variometer in my hood a lot of times because since I do no fins and it's a arm stroke like this, the watch, the variometer can get confused because my hand, the watch is changing elevation independent of me. Whereas if it's, you know, in my, where my head is, it gives a pretty accurate representation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so variometer. And then if the diver in question, um, the ascent alarm can also be really cool, um, depending on, you know, how they dive, what they do. We A lot of times in those situations, you might take your ascent depth off of the safety divers, but mm -hmm. also having, having alarm can be helpful to, um, to understand where your buoyancy is changing and, and so on and so right. forth. All right, so uh, last question here is about surface training. You, you mentioned the power aspect of deep diving um, and muscles working on low or no O2. Uh, is there any dry land training you would recommend to improve muscle power specific to free diving? Yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of hypoxic cardio. Um, uh, I do breath hold intervals on dry cardio machines. Um, it's uh, That's always been something I've fundamentally done. Uh, I don't do a lot of like, you know, static tables or anything. Um, it's not my competitive specialty. And nowadays, a lot of, I would say most deep divers, you know, you've got a pretty good static, but it's not a cornerstone of training that you sit around practicing holding your breath because because it's it's a huge element, but especially for depth, it's takes, you're, you're the, the muscles are the engine and you, you got to get down there and back. It's like that hypoxic muscle load and, and really yeah. working under under hypoxia yeah, working, is really yeah working the muscles under hypoxic load um uh i would say and then what you know traditional weightlifting and things like that also can work anaerobically although i prefer plyometric as opposed to just traditional strength uh type 2b muscle fibers are notoriously difficult to train the body will will resist using those as much as possible um so uh, generally, you've got to exercise a muscle pretty much to failure before it decides to recruit mm -hmm. those fibers. And so, yeah, like breath hold intervals on a cardio machine followed by plyometrics, like immediately, you know, while I'm still in that anaerobic burn. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds and, fun, and so, right. So quick disclosure here, Lance. I think you, you gave me some of this advice once and, and I want to make sure the uh, the stationary component of that that yes. training is <laughs> is uh, is heard. I, I think I was. Uh, trying to do this out on an outdoor run and realize pretty quickly that holding your breath for a long time on a run is probably not safe. Yeah, yeah, we, we uh, a lot of free divers um, uh, that, that actually train for their diving do dry work because there's no chance of drowning. But if you black <laughs> out and you hit your head, um, <laughs> that's pretty bad leaning as well. out on the sidewalk or even just in the gym, you may not die, but it's gonna be a scene. So, so to do it in the safe environment, stationary bike or, or the like um, is, a, is a great way to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for everyone here for joining us today. Um, thanks for, for everyone that tuned in to learn more about freediving. Um, if you want to learn more about Lance, you can find him on Instagram. That's at SoCal Spirit, S-O-C-A-L-S-P-E-A-R-I-T. Uh, he has a website, SoCalSpirit.com, where you can sign up for one of his classes. Uh, highly recommend that from personal experience. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about the Garmin Descent Dive Computers, go on over to Garmin.com. Uh, if you want to dig into the features we talked about today, check out the Dive Science page. That should be linked in the chat. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lance, for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. <laughs>